All right, um, let's go ahead and get started, please. Uh, so welcome to the Center for Informatics and Computational Science seminar. Uh, by the way, I realize there's likely a lot of new faces here that probably don't come to this seminar on a regular basis, but this is a weekly recurring seminar. Uh, there happens to be a particularly biological focus this week, but there's a lot of other um, great seminars that speak to the various um, tools that are very useful across disciplines, so I'd encourage you to check it out in the longer term. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who is uh, Professor Jeff Shaman from Columbia University. Um, Jeff is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences and the School of Public Health. Um, he did his bachelor's in biology at uh, Penn, his PhD in climate science at Columbia, and then a postdoc at Harvard. So he's really had um, a very wide range of experience, both in biology and climate science. And because of that, he's really one of the few individuals who really I think can speak effectively across both of those dis different disciplines and ident identify problems that are really sort of a, a very interesting and important intersection of those fields. Um, so I think you may see a little bit of that come across in his uh, talk today, but um, in his work more broadly, certainly that's, uh, that's very noticeable. Um, he's also very well known for influenza forecasting. Um, we were talking today, there's really just sort of a handful of groups that have been really at this for a long time, but it's something that's been um, picking up a lot of steam and, and gained a lot of interest, uh, including from the federal government and the CDC. Um, how do we sort of make forecasts of seasonal influence in the United States? How do we actually put those into practice and, and actually um, improve public health outcomes with those tools? So, um, like I said, Jeff is really a leader in all of that, um, and I look forward to hearing him talk about that today. So let's give him a round of applause today. So I forgot to hook up the microphone, but can you guys hear me if I talk like this? All right, everybody in the back is good. All right, then I'm going to go ahead without it. I can bellow. Um, so um, thank you for having me here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the work we did on forecasts, that we do on forecasting, as Alex alluded to. And I want to frame it and contextualize what I mean by forecasting, get into some of the methods and perspectives that we've employed to actually generate operational real-time forecasts with a particular focus on influenza, but I'll also talk about how we use some of those same methods to address inference problems and other disease systems along the way. Um, so here we go. I don't mind if you interrupt and ask questions. Is that all right for YouTube and all? All right, we got to go ahead and you can do that. So if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand or shout out. We'll see where we go. I, I like to point out that that thing right there, that's a sneeze. That's not a cough. He's not having a spasm. So when you sneeze, it's mostly coming out of your mouth. Just a little factoid. All right. So what about prediction? Uh, when I'm talking about forecasting, I need to uh, contextualize that within the idea of what I actually mean. All right. So what you're seeing up here is a little figure. Is everybody going crazy with this? She's in trouble. You're banished. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so when we're talking about forecasting, different people have different uh, ideas about what forecasting means. So I want to define it fairly clearly here, just so that we're all on the same page as to what I'm talking about with that, and then we can go forward and, and speak freely, so to speak. So what I have here is a map of preparedness for infectious disease outbreaks. It's a very loose breakdown of how you might divvy up the different types of tasks that you take in to uh, account and actually act on in order to prepare for an emerging pandemic or even seasonal flus or spillover of some zoonotic disease. So the stuff on the upper left is basic surveillance and emergence detection, the type of stuff that you would do to keep tabs on how pathogens are moving through uh, animal populations, uh, whether they're spilling over to humans, the type of diagnostics that you do and you'd ideally like to see be done at the level that we see in the developed world in the developing world as well. Now on the upper right is something I call risk mapping and the idea of trying to figure out what the emergence potential is for a particular pandemic. And so this is the type of forecasting or prediction that people refer to when they're trying to say, well, can you predict the next pandemic? 
That is a very different task than what I'm going to talk to you about today. I think that's very challenging. I haven't really ever seen anyone do that kind of prediction, to be perfectly honest, for any discipline. It's analogous to me saying to you right now, I predict a hurricane is going to hit Miami on September 12th of 2019. That kind of prediction is too far in the future of an event that hasn't even begun to spin up. And as a consequence, we have no basis statistically or dynamically of making that prediction uh, using some sort of modeling approach. However, within that context, you can do things using cartographic methods, things like ecological niche modeling, and actually try to figure out where the range and distribution of pathogens the appropriate hosts, how they're interacting with humans, when is the climate or the environment or the land use, where is it also conducive for spillover. So that type of thing allows you to make maps that broadly characterize in a st somewhat static fashion what the emergence potential and risk are for different locations. Now, the part that I am going to focus on is the stuff on the bottom here, and that's forecasting in which we already have the signal of an emergent disease or a seasonally recurring disease being measured. It's something for which we are going to leverage the, op the observations and our understanding of the system to use some form of models to make a probabilistic prediction of how the trajectory will unfold, how severe it will be, what its timing will be, what the duration will be, what the overall attack rate will be. So, that is the context within which I am talking about forecasts or prediction, and I tend to use the words interchangeably. Some people have alternate definitions, but I tend to be a little loosey-goose about that. Now, I do think it's important that we not think about forecasts as some unique information phenomenon. I really think of it as part of a larger continuum or stream of information that's available for, to us to make judicious decisions about what to do about an infectious disease outbreak. It starts with observations which tell us about information that occurred in the past. It continues with something that we call nowcasts, which are these statistical algorithms that we use to estimate conditions right now when we might not have complete or even any observations of the actual present. And it goes into the future when we actually make forecasts that try to tell us something about how conditions are going to be in the future. Now you'll notice on this little cartoon schematic that I put these uncertainty bars here. There's the uncertainty and, whoops, there are the bars. And you can see that they're increasing as you go from the past to the present to the future. And that indicates that there's a general trend that the information that we get about the past tends to be more certain than the information we can now cast for the present or the information that we forecast for the future. Now, that's not always the case. There are lousy observations. We've all encountered them. And there are very good forecasts, which are much better than those lousy observations and have lower uncertainty. However, it is a general trend that as you move into the future, your uncertainty is going to grow. It is our job as researchers to try to make systems that gain these observations and generate these nowcasts and generate these forecasts that shrink that uncertainty, that reduce that error that make it so that we can have more confidence in the information that we're using so that we can use it and understand what the information allows us to do in a decision framework. And I think the other important thing to recognize is that any smart judicious use of this data has to account for the uncertainty. If you have an observation and you don't know the error structure or the uncertainty of it, you're flying a little bit blind there. And the same thing goes for the forecasts. We want to account for that uncertainty there so we can use it to our advantage to make an informed decision on how to act. So, the problem. The problem that we started forecasting with in my group was looking at seasonal influenza. And what you're seeing here is a plot of one measure that we use for seasonal influenza. It's called influenza-like illness. This is a syndromic surveillance that people who go to a sentinel medical clinic or hospital, if they go there and they present with a fever of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater and a cough or sore throat, they are slapped with the diagnostic label of influenza-like illness or ILI. And they tally up the number of people who have ILI and they put that over the number of patients they saw that week and that gives us a weekly measure of ILI. When you look at that upper right plot, 
That is an estimate for New York City of ILI over a number of seasons. You're seeing different seasons there depicted from October through September of the following year. That one in yellow that you see right here that's a little early, that's actually the second wave of the 2009 pandemic. We can ignore that for now because that's not seasonal flu. But the other ones are all manifestations of seasonal influenza. And what you can see is that there are real differences there. There's differences in the timing, there's differences in the peak, how much, how high the, uh, the numbers are in the peak week. There's differences in the duration and there's the differences in the total area under the curve. And the problem with making a prediction for something like this is that the dynamics that underlie whether you get the flu and how it's transmitted and how it moves through communities are nonlinear. And that leads to this irregularity that's there. And it is more challenging to predict nonlinear systems than it is to predict linear systems. And because of this variability, if I were to take a dynamical model that represents with some differential equations influenza in a particular community and try to predict that just using that model, I'm going to do a terrible job. All right? So the question was, well, how do we get around this? How do we make a system that's going to be able to handle this nonlinearity in the dynamics underlying it, represent it, and still make a prediction that is reliable. Whoops. So what we did for doing this, and this partly gets to what Alex referred to, my background being in climate and weather, is we decided we wanted to mimic some of the strategies that they use to generate numerical weather predictions. So numerical weather predictions are confronted with the same problem. The atmosphere is highly nonlinear. Chaos, deterministic chaos, Lorenz equations all came about from studying elements of the atmosphere. Uh, and yet, in spite of that, we are able to numerically represent the atmosphere in some very large and complicated models and make skillful predictions of future outcomes of weather that we all rely on in one way or another, right? So if we're going to mimic it, we are not going to be making weather-based forecasts. I want to make that clear. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the strategies that they use in numerical weather prediction, but we're going to be transferring them to an infectious disease system. Okay? So the three basic ingredients that they use in numerical weather prediction are, one, an observationally validated model of the system. For weather, that is a model that depicts the dynamics, the thermodynamics, the radiative processes of the atmosphere. For us, this is going to be an observationally validated model that describes the propagation of influenza through a community. All right? The second ingredient they use are estimates. They need observations, and they need a lot of observations. Again, for weather prediction, they're using ground-based stations, they're using balloon soundings, they're using airplanes and boats, they're using satellite sensors. They're feeding all this information into their model using the third ingredient, which are these data and simulation methods, which go by a number of, of names. For influenza, we're going to have something like that ILI I just showed you. And that's going to be our real-time observation of what's going on with the system. And we, too, are going to use data simulation methods, and we're going to use that to combine the observations and the model in an effort to get a better estimate of what actually is going on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of these elements now. So when we first started doing this, we started very, very simply. We wanted a very low dimensional system so it would be easier to optimize. If we used a complicated model that was complex and had number, a high number of degrees of freedom, we weren't going to be able to optimize it given the limited palette of observations that we have available to us. So the model that we use there actually does have a weather forcing in there. But it is, again, this is not weather forcing that I'm going to be describing, per se. This is a model that is a humidity-forced SIRS model. Some of you may be familiar with it, but if those are not, I'll just go through it. An SIRS model is a compartmental model that divides the population of a given location, South Bend, Chicago, Indianapolis, New York City, into classes based on their disease status. Those who are susceptible to the pathogen being modeled, those who are infected by it, and those who have recovered from it, hence S-I-R. There's an additional S that leads from the R all the way back to the S compartment because for influenza, people can become infected more than once. So there's some duration of immunity following recover, following which they become susceptible again. Now, between the compartments, 
there are these Greek exponents there, though they're not always written in as Greek exponents in the equations there, sorry about that. But the Greek exponents refer to the rates of transition between the compartments, how quickly people will move from susceptible to infected, from infected to recovered, and from recovered back to susceptible. The model is very simple. It's just those two equations that you see in the lower right there. It's just a two-variable nonlinear oscillator, damp force oscillator due to the humidity forcing. It's pretty simple. We've been able to use this model to describe the seasonal cycle of influenza throughout the United States merely by using local humidity forcing. In other words, we take an observed record of humidity conditions, in particular specific humidity. We can force the model with that, and it will represent the seasonal cycle of what's going on with flu in the United States with some veracity, okay? So that's, that's good. However, again, if we were to just try to run this model with humidity forcing and make a prediction, it will do a terrible job. So what about the observations? Well, we've used different measures as uh, observational estimates of influenza activity in different places. I'm going to go into a little bit of that a little later, but let me just start with the one that we principally focused on in my group, which is something we call ILI+. Plus. I did talk to you before about ILI and how that is a syndromic surveillance because all they're using to make the diagnosis is whether you have a fever and a cough or sore throat. The consequence of that is it's not specific for flu. It captures a lot of other respiratory pathogens adenovirus, coronavirus, rhinovirus, parainfluenza, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, all these other circulating viruses that manifest with the same symptoms. They're all getting lumped together. So what we do to make our ILI plus, because one of the other components of standard surveillance as it is practiced in the US, is to take a fraction of the people who are presenting with ILI and swab them and run an assay on that and determine if they are indeed positive with the flu. So in conjunction with the syndromic surveillance, which tells us ILI, we also have virological surveillance, which tells us positivity rates at the same time. So we multiply the positivity rates times the syndromic surveillance. We call it ILI plus. And what this does is, to some extent, it filters out the rhinovirus, the respiratory syncytial virus, and all the other stuff, and gives us a signal that's a little bit more flu-specific. And we can get this on a weekly basis. And you can see what happens when you do the multiplication here, looking at this plot, because the blue is ILI only, and the green is ILI plus. Now, they have different y-axes. You can see the right is where the green is, and it's not nearly as high. It's only a quarter of the magnitude as of the ILI signal alone. But what you also can see is that for a number of the years, 2005, 6, and 7, it's really cutting off the early <laughs> stages of the outbreak. There's very little flu activity taking place there. And this is isolating, again, the flu signal, which is one of the things that we wanted to do, because our model is trying to model flu. It's not modeling flu and adenovirus and coronavirus, et cetera. So the third ingredient are data assimilation methods. This is what they refer to them in the geosciences. They go by a lot of other names. They're Bayesian inference methods. They're sometimes called sequential Monte Carlo methods by statisticians. There are all sorts of forms of them, particle filters, Kalman filters, variational methods. They're all Bayesian inference. And the idea is to iteratively filter observations in a statistically rigorous fashion into an evolving model construct. And I'm going to tell you why we're using this and how this actually manifests without going into the specific details of each of these filters here. I'll tell you that well, the one that we rely on the most happens to be an ensemble Kalman filter that's called the ensemble adjustment Kalman filter. It's a specific way of addressing uh, the covariance, error covariance matrix minimization problem when you do this iterative filtering. Uh, but all of them work well and do well uh, they just have different bells and whistles, and some of them are more um, successfully used with higher dimensional systems. As a matter of fact, it's the Kalman filter that ultimately is more successfully used with high dimensional systems. All right, so why are we doing this? We do this, and I've said repeatedly that one of the big problems with just running a model alone and trying to make a prediction of a nonlinear system is it's going to do a lousy job. And the reason why it does a lousy job is because there's error in the system. Your model representation of that system 
has error in it. And if it, the system is nonlinear, that error will grow. All right? The error comes because the model has structural problems. The model I described for you, this humidity forced SIRS model, it's really simple. I mean, this is a trivial toy model. It pretends that everybody, if we're modeling Indianapolis, is in the same room, basically, with equal contact to one another. It doesn't care about anything else. It's really simplistic in that way. We know it has structural flaws. That's a source of error. We also don't know the initial state when we're making a forecast. How many people are susceptible? How many people are infected? How aggressively is the virus moving through the population and affecting those rates of transition between those compartments of the SIRS model? All that's unknown. If we put that in wrong, if we specify that incorrectly, that too will lead to error in our simulations. So if we leave it to our own devices, its own devices, the model forecast, if you don't constrain it, will deviate from reality. So if this is the true outcome in black, you might get something where the model simulates something like this in some state space. Make it look a little bit more epidemiological, it might look like this, where the true outcome is this black curve right here, and the model simulation and forecast is this red thing right here. Now that's a terrible forecast. If we're going to pretend that these are weeks on the x-axis as some arbitrary time unit, that's a terrible forecast that's made right there, right? And if we made that forecast, let's say, on week 15, it's even more egregious simply because there were observations at hand that told us there had been, for the last five, six weeks, an uptick in activity. We want to use that information. We want to inform the model, hey, the last six weeks, we've seen a small exponential growth in the occurrence of influenza in the local population. It's moved through at this rate and make some inferences about it to tell us what we really should be. We should be starting week 15 somewhere around there in terms of our incidence. We should have a susceptibility that reflects how aggressively this has moved through the population as well as parameters that are appropriate for it. What we're doing with the data assimilation is we're making these inferences and we're doing it on the fly. So what is in fact happening? Well, the way that you go through this, and I got to stop looking up at that because that's going to kill my neck, is that we have the real-time observations, right? And we have our data assimilation methods, and we're going to use them recursively to optimize our model. So if I want to make a forecast for Indianapolis, let's say this week, I'm not going to just start the model here at this week and run it into the future. I'm going to start it back in October, at the beginning of the flu season. And I'm not going to just run one simulation. I'm going to run an ensemble of simulations. And I'm going to randomly seed them with some sort of initial combination of state variables and parameters. And I'm going to let them be integrated into the future. And the minute I get to an observation, let's say week 40 of last year, I stop everything. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that observation and the Bayesian inference, the data assimilation method, to, you can think of it as a correction, but it's really an update of the parameters and state space variables of that model. And I'm going to do it according to Bayes' rule fundamentally in this error covariance matrix minimization problem. And then I'm going to have a, what's called a posterior after I've done that. And I'm going to run it forward again until I hit the next observation. And then I'm going to do it again. And this is why it's iterative, because I'm going to continually do it. And the thinking is that over the course of successive weeks, as I bring more and more information to bear, the model's behavior becomes more and more aligned with the outbreak as it is actually manifest. It's not trying to do it exactly because we understand that those observations have error themselves, okay? And we have to account for that observational error. However, we're going to get it so that its behavior is more aligned with where we think the true outbreak is, is taking place, how it is taking place. And the hope is that if we keep doing this with successive weeks until we get up to the present, when we've used our last optimus, uh, observation, that our model is sufficiently well optimized that we can run it into the future. We have no more observations. We just run it through to the net rest of the season, and that becomes our forecast. All right? And we hope that we're at a good starting point and that the prediction will represent what happens in the future well. All right. That's the name of the game with this. When it works well, it looks something like this. So we first did operational real-time forecasting of influenza in 2012-13. We did it for 
a little over 100 cities in the United States. Obviously, Salt Lake City was one of them. And what you're seeing here is a forecast that we generated for Salt Lake City in week 50, which is about December 15th of 2012 during that season. The black X's on that plot, those show observations that we had in hand at the time of forecast. The red X's are observations that we did not know, but obviously we do now because it's in the past. The blue line is that posterior I referred to, okay? That is the posterior estimate of the model after it's been adjusted for the observations. And you can see it's actually hewing pretty close to where the observations are. Now, the gray lines, each gray line there, represents the mean trajectory of a 200-member ensemble forecast. There are 150 of them there, and the only difference between them is the initial conditions that we put in each of those 200 ensemble members randomly chosen way back at around week 32 when we initiated these ensembles. So what you're seeing there in the difference between those gray lines is the uncertainty due to the initial conditions across ensembles. Now again, each gray line is the average of a 200 member ensemble. Now, we did some things pretty well with this forecast. We're capturing the overall duration of the outbreak pretty well. The attack rate, which is the area under the curve, is fairly well represented. We're predicting that the peak will occur in week three of 2013, which indeed it is when it occurs. Now the height of it, the intensity of the outbreak, is not captured by any one of these average lines, but what you'll see is that statistically speaking, we're actually doing quite fine with that, and I'll show you that in just a moment. So we made this forecast right then, and the thing that we were interested when we first started doing the forecast was just seeing, can we predict what week the peak will be, right? And when we made this forecast, the forecast we would say is we would say, well, the, we, the forecast says that influenza is going to peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City. And it happens to be right in this instance, okay? Which is, which is good. But we want to do something more than that. We don't want to just say that because that is not a sufficient amount of information. We want to also find ways of communicating the uncertainty associated with this forecast. So the analogy that we often use and the way we thought about it at first was to try to communicate it, again, the way they do weather forecasts. They don't tell you there's that, you know, it's going to rain tomorrow in South Bend, Indiana. That's not what they say on the local weather uh, forecast when they give the weather report and forecast. What they actually tell you is there's an 80% chance of rain, or there's a 30% chance of rain, or there's a 10% chance of rain, right? And if you were to line up and go through all the one-day-ahead forecasts that they've given over the last 30 years in South Bend, Indiana, and take out all the days where they said there's an 80% chance of for, uh, rain tomorrow, you'll find it rained on almost exactly 80% of those days. And you can go to 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, all the way down the line using National Weather Service forecasts, and you're going to find that those probabilities are highly calibrated. That is a very reliable forecast, which means its distribution of the error of the forecast is very accurate. All right? Now, we want to be able to do the same thing. We want to be able to say, there's a 70% chance that flu is going to peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City, or there's a 10% chance that flu will peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City. Because those differences in certainty allow for actionable interpretation. So the way we get at that is we pull apart one of those gray lines I showed you. So those gray lines were the mean of a 200-member ensemble. What you're now looking at is one of those 200-member ensembles, and what it looks like. The magenta that's running through that is that mean trajectory that you saw before, both the posterior and the forecast. The blue lines are showing you the posterior ensemble. There's disagreement there. They're not all lined up at the same spot. They have different parameters, state space variables. They're in different positions when they're starting the forecast right here. You can see the range of estimates that they have for what the actual incidence conditions are. Now, when we do the forecast, you can see there's a lot of disagreement in all these green lines. And statistically, we're doing well because our uncertainty bounds, though they're quite large, are actually capturing that red dot way up there. Makes the statistician happy, all right? But one of the other things that we found is that there's actually a relationship between how much agreement 
those different ensemble members have for a particular forecast and how certain that outcome is. When there's a lot of disagreement between those ensemble members, we have a very uncertain forecast. When there's more agreement, we have a more certain forecast. So it turns out that we can actually use this information in real time to make estimates of the certainty of our forecasts and say 60% chance that flu will peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City versus there's a 15% chance that flu will peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City. Both of them are saying that our best guess is that flu will peak in five weeks in Salt Lake City, but one of them attributes a lot higher confidence in that outcome occurring than the other. One may be more actionable, the other one may result in a wait and see approach before you make any operational decisions ultimately. All right, so what did we do with all this? We had built this system, we had tested it out with ILI, and then in 2012-13, we ran it for 108 cities using ILI Plus, as I told you about. And one of the things we wanted to do was see and verify a number of issues as we tested out this ensemble forecasting system. Firstly, what was the overall accuracy of the forecast? Are they better than you would do using simple historical expectance or resampling, simple statistical methods, right? Secondly, what is that expected accuracy which refers to those probabilities I talked about just now. In other words, when we say there's a 70% chance of something occurring, does it occur 70% of the time? Can we get those calibrations right? <clears throat> and the third is, how far in the future are we actually able to make a forecast, right? And have some accuracy with it. That's a very important question. If you think about weather, Weather is a highly nonlinear, it's a chaotic system, and there are well-defined limits of predictability that are 14 days. As a matter of fact, if you go out and you look at your weather forecasts, get beyond three days, they're not doing so hot, all right? They're not a lot of as much information as you'd like in there, okay? It's getting better, but you could certainly see some improvement. And the forecast telling you what it's gonna be like in a week really got a lot of uncertainty associated with it. Infectious diseases, are not as strongly nonlinear, at least not as we're modeling them. So can we make predictions farther into the future as a consequence? All right, so you're gonna to start to see some plots which may be a little bit abstract, but I'll try to walk you through them here. So the first issue we wanted to verify, how accurate are these forecasts <coughs> when we do them operationally in real time? And how do they compare to analog methods, simple analog methods? Well. What you're seeing here is a plot for week 47 of 2012 through week 6 of 2013, and it shows the accuracy of our forecast, the fraction of all the forecasts for those 108 cities for each week that were accurate, that predicted the timing, the peak, when it would be uh, for those cities. The blue line shows the SIRS, Ensemble Adjustment Common Filter Framework, that we built. And what you can see is that, you know, by the time we got to week 52 right here, 63% of our forecasts, its uh, peaks were accurate, all right? And that was two or more weeks ahead of the true peak of 84% of the cities. As we got further along, our probabilities got higher. I mean, a fraction of accurate got higher, went up to 75%. Should also note that it is important when you hit or are past the peak to still make predictions because you don't have any idea if you're gonna have a double whammy and it's gonna go back up and be higher again. That happened this year, Alex and I were just talking about that before I got up here. So you need to keep making predictions for even these types of seasonal targets. In the lower portion right there, what you're seeing are those seasonal analog forecasts. And you can see that they're just sort of a range of probabilities, it's fairly constant, it hasn't been informed. It's doing much better. Now, this is not to dismiss statistical methods. I'll come back to that briefly later in the talk. There are much more sophisticated statistical methods, many of them Bayesian, some of them frequentist, that you can use to generate forecasts that really do just as well as what we're doing. But they're relying on some of the same sort of ensemble approaches. All right? All right. So we have some accuracy. Now, for the expected accuracy, this is a little abstract, but what you're seeing is a breakdown with these red lines showing you how the ensemble spread measured as this log ensemble variance within that 200 member ensemble, as it increases, you're seeing with the red line, you have a decrease 
in the fraction of forecast that historically, when we did it retrospectively, were accurate. And you see a similar pattern, a little weaker, for four to six week ahead predictions, and a similar one with lower accuracy for seven to nine week ahead predictions. And then with the blue line, it shows you how well they did for that specific year. And what you're looking is, do the blue lines and the red lines essentially match up? And you can see, eh, somewhat. I mean, we did well here, sort of. Here, it's sort of bouncing around the target, but it's a little high there and a little low there. And then over here, what we can see is for seven to nine weeks, we got lucky. We weren't a lot of forecasts, and they happened to be very accurate when we had these long lead forecasts. So the initial indications were that we had some information that we could glean out of expected accuracy, but it is a bit of a statistical process. As we build up more and more information and we evaluate it over more and more years of doing real-time forecasts, these guys are coming into alignment with one another. The other thing it shows is that we were able to make forecasts nine weeks in advance and have some accuracy there. Whether or not it's actionable, that's another question, but there is accuracy in the forecast going that far out. Now I'm just going to show you what a succession of forecasts looks like because there's some information to be gleaned from it. So again, the black X's are information in hand. The red X's are observations that we didn't have in hand at the time of forecast. <coughs> and the uh, black line here is just the, the ensemble mean of a single forecast here. And I'm just going to click through it and you're going to get to see how this evolves. So now we're week 48, 49. Here's that prediction that you saw that I showed you before for week 50, 51, 52, week 1, 2, etc. I'm going to show you the same thing now, but I'm going to show you with all the spaghetti on it now. Colors have changed a bit. The magenta is the mean trajectory. The green is now the posterior. The gray lines are now all the little forecasts, the 200 member ensemble. And what you're seeing on the right is the the actual predictions of each of the individual ensemble members shown as a distribution. So the x-axis shows the week of that uh, it's predicting the peak occurred. And you can see for this initial forecast, some of them are predicting the peak already occurred way back in October. That might be like this line right here, which started really high and just dropped down. It happened to be initialized with high conditions. And it goes down, and then maybe it goes like this. And so it predicts the peak occurred back in October. And there's a big spread right here. In addition, the black line shows you the week the forecast is being initiated, which is right here on this. The red shows you the actual occurrence of the peak, which is that week three. And the blue dot right there is the mean prediction across this ensemble when you make this magenta line. All right? What you're going to see as I click through now is how the ensemble is converging. You're going to see it on the right because the, the histogram is going to shrink laterally. And you're going to see it with the gray lines coming together as well as I click through. And that's as the certainty starts to come together. You can already see that there's a lot less spread in the gray and a lot less spread in the green. So we get to week 50. There's a real change in the characteristics from where I showed you back here, where it's a lot more spread. And as we get closer, you can see that it's going to narrow more and more. Very narrow distribution. So this shows you a little bit of the machinery that's going on underneath and how we're using this and how the ensemble provides a probabilistic range of outcomes from which we can determine a mean estimate of what will happen as well as an uncertainty range around it as well as a, an attempt to calibrate it using that expected accuracy or expected likelihood I mentioned. All right. so. Those were our initial efforts at doing operational real-time forecasting. One of the things we then said to ourselves is, well, what else needs to be done here? And the answer is there's a lot. There are three basic elements of this. There's a model, there's observations, and there's this data assimilation. Can we improve any of these? Can we make better models? Can we make models that have better processes in it? Are there observations that would be better for informing more complicated models so we can su support greater degrees of freedom, more complexity in the model, and actually simulate more processes? Would that be a benefit? Can we build better data simulation algorithms that are more appropriate for this type of biological system? And can we actually work on the post-processing of them? How we actually determine these expected accuracies, 
how we compensate statistically for model misspecification, perhaps, or error growth. And then lastly, what do we do with this? How do we actually communicate this well to public health officials and start to try to get it integrated into their thinking so that they might use it in an intuitive operational way that's sensible? All right. So why do we want to do all that? Well, this is a plot I take from the NOAA website. This is from the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And what it shows you is 36 and 72 hour forecast skill or accuracy. Increasing skill means increasing accuracy relative to some standard. And what you're seeing is an improvement in the accuracy representing just this halfway up the atmosphere. It's called the 500 millibar height field over all of North America. So a very large scale field that they're predicting with a numerical weather model. And what you're seeing is that since the dawn of numerical weather prediction, when they first built computers in 1955, all the way through here, almost up to the present, there's basically been a monotonic increase in the skill, the accuracy of weather prediction forecasts at both 36 and then at 72 hour leads. All right? This is very encouraging. And why did this come about? Well, in this plot, they happen to want to accentuate the computing power. So they're showing all the different computers that have come online that have allowed them to do higher resolution, more complicated simulations of the actual weather of the atmosphere, which allows for greater detailing of processes, better representation of processes, and better forecast accuracy. But also, according with this, they've had a better understanding of the physics. They've been able to incorporate more of those processes, again, come back, back to computation. They brought data simulation algorithms into the mix so that they actually started assimilating and using observations. And very, very critically, the suite of observations available for them has grown. And it has grown in very powerful ways. When they started out, they did not have any satellite estimates of what's going on on the planet. 1979 is usually the year that's pointed to as the year when satellites really came online and you had good global retrieval of a number of fields in the atmosphere, this has continued to expand and improve. And this is the information that they're feeding into these models. So the aim or of this plot is really to show you that it's been investment in computation, research into the physics, research into the data simulation, and the developments of new observations and research into algorithms for retrieving new fields that has fed a whole suite of new observations to the weather models, all of which have contributed to the improvement in numerical weather prediction. And it has gotten a lot better, as you can see here. For in infectious disease forecasts, we would hope to follow a similar trajectory, perhaps one that's a little more accelerated because we are standing on with certain advantages learned from things like numerical weather prediction. So what have we done? Well, we've done comparison of filtering methods. We've done a paper where we took six different filtering methods, particle filters, different types of ensemble filters, common filters, that is. Uh, we've used uh, PMCMC methods, and we've used this iterative filtering method uh, that was developed up at the University of Michigan. We've applied them all and compared the forecast of it, and seen that there are some differences that, you know, roughly speaking, what we call the single pass filters, as opposed to the PMCMC and the MIF, tend to do a little bit better in generating forecasts, um, but that the forecast uh, performance is comparable. We did develop a technique called space reprobing. Wan Yang really developed this. Uh, she was in my group for a number of years and started as an assistant professor in epidemiology at Columbia now, where the idea is that you want to sort of reinitiate a minority of either the ensemble members or the particles in a particle filter every now and then to prevent there from being some sort of convergence in the wrong area. And it's a, an effort to try to continue to find the appropriate global solution. And for a biological system, this can be very important because sometimes biological systems change. You don't want to get locked in the wrong solution space, the long local uh, minimum, when there's really something else that may evolve or appear somewhere else. And this does indeed help our method, help our, our forecasts a bit. We've done forecasts where we've looked at influenza by type and subtype. I told you before how we didn't want to work with ILI because we wanted to get something that was more flu specific. We've also looked at different types and subtypes of flu. So we partition it into A, H1N1, A, H3N2, and type B. And we found that we can make 
forecasts specific to those viruses if we have access to that information. And we did it here in subtropical Hong Kong, and we have some accuracy of forecast. We've also done this in the US as well, and what we found is actually interesting. Because the model that we're using is meant to represent a single pathogen, and when you model H3N2 as opposed to ILI+, you are focusing much more clearly on a single pathogen as opposed to a collection of co-circulating flu strains. Because of that, the model performs better. And what we found is that if we forecast the individual types and subtypes in the U.S., we are more accurate than if we forecast ILI+. Plus. Furthermore, if we were to forecast the individual types and subtypes and just add their forecasts together very simply, that makes a better forecast of ILI plus than using ILI plus by itself. Um, this is another one where we found that we could actually calibrate that expected likelihood and accuracy not only by using the spread of the ensemble, but also looking at whether or not it made the same forecast last week and the week before, that when it actually sticks on the same forecast outcome, that there's a higher probability that it's getting it right. So we can further refine those expected probabilities. Now, I told you this is a humidity force model, and that comes out of another line of research where we found associations between humidity and the survival of influenza, its transmissibility, and its seasonality. We also looked to see whether or not having humidity forcing in the model, which is what we just started with, was beneficial. We can make the forecast without humidity forcing. We don't need it there. But does it add any value having local humidity conditions for Indianapolis and using them when you make a forecast? And the answer was yes. As a matter of fact, the no humidity forecasts, which are these guys right here, ranked the worst out of three other, out of four models, the other three of which use some form of humidity, absolute humidity, in the forcing of the model. Now, I should note that when we make a prediction that goes out five weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks into the future, we don't have information about humidity. I just told you the numerical weather predictions are lousy, can't trust them. So what we typically have to rely on is climatological, what the typical conditions on that day were in South Bend or Chicago or Indiana, Indianapolis, okay? And that is what we've done operationally. And we had also tested that and found that that is a comparable, if not actually slightly better, forecast uh, production with that. Now, I mentioned that you don't just have to use process-based approaches. You can use statistical approaches. They are used in a number of climate predictions, not for weather predictions so much, but for climate prediction, like El Nino forecasts. They use statistical models. They use dynamical models. They compare the two. They tend to do about equivalent with one another. Um, so we've generated some purely statistical models. They tend to be, we generate ours in a Bayesian framework, and they do well. They do well indeed. Um, one of the other things that you can do with the statistical methods is a post-processing to create multi-model or super-ensemble forecasts. Now, this is something that's also used in climate and weather forecasting, and that is the realization that when you have a particular model generating forecasts, it is subject to its limitations. Its model with specification is going to lead to certain biases in the types of behaviors that it is able to predict. But if you were to combine models from different centers with different uh, conditions and structures, you might offset those biases against one another. And they found for things like hurricane forecasts, weather forecasts in general, El Nino forecasting, if you just take a simple average of different models, that simple average does better. It produces more accurate forecasts on average than any of the individual component models. Or it's near the top, let's say, not necessarily all of them. You can do even better if you do a weighted average. Again, not all models are producing equivalent forecasts. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, right? So if you can evaluate their past performance and develop objective weights based on how well they do, you can make a weighted average. And when we do that, it performs even better as well. So this is something we've experimented with as well. We took 20 different dynamical models, which are actually really variants of the same theme. And we've actually combined that also with that purely statistical model. We make a weighted average. And it does indeed do better than the individual component models. We've also participated the last couple of years in a multi-group super ensemble or multi-model approach. And that really brings in some real disparate approaches 
to making forecasts and actually allows us to see how the super ensemble approach works in that context. We've also studied error growth. I mentioned that. This is a nonlinear system. You have initial conditions. You make a forecast. You're going to have deviation from the true trajectory because the small errors in that are going to grow in the model's construct and lead to a large deviation ultimately. It's why we have limits of predictability in weather, and ultimately it's why our accuracy, the farther into the future we go, is attenuated for both weather and for these flu predictions. So we've been able to actually diagnose the structure of that. We used a couple of methods. One's called the breeding method I'm showing you here. It shows the relationship of the error structure between state variables and parameters within the model. We're then actually able to use that information to make an additional correction or optimization. So we already have it paired with a state space estimation method, this ensemble Kalman filter I mentioned, and that provides really a linear correction to the system state. We're then able to actually diagnose the error growth by going back a week, running it forward again, and using that to make a further correction to the system. And actually then we make a better forecast when we do that. Now, we've also applied this to other infectious diseases. We don't just have to look at influenza. We've applied it to respiratory syncytial virus, West Nile virus, dengue, and we even did it for Ebola during the 2014 West African outbreak. <coughs> just going to show you a couple of the plots briefly. West Nile virus is a somewhat more sophisticated model, and in this we have two observational data streams, human cases of West Nile virus, that's the lower plots, and mosquito infection rates. There are some counties in the country that collect mosquitoes. They then grind them up in pools and determine uh, whether they're positive or negative for West Nile virus, and you can make a maximum likelihood estimate of whether, how many mosquitoes were actually infected. We use this information, and what you're seeing is successive weeks of forecast for those mosquito infection rates, and also our predictions of how many human cases we're going to see. And the interesting thing is our lead times for making accurate forecasts from the mosquitoes is somewhat limited. It's usually not till the peak is right upon us. But the peak of the mosquito infection rates leads the peak in the human case numbers. And as a consequence, we're able to get really decent lead time predictions of West Nile virus human cases, the spillover, that really could inform uh, public health agencies and hospital practices. Now, we've tried doing this in real time, but there's a big problem associated with that. While West Nile virus infection is a notifiable disease in the U.S., that notification takes up to 12 weeks. So getting that data in real time for real-time forecast, it's not sufficient. We can't make good forecasts because that seriously corrupts our ability. We need that data stream. So one of the things that we would request for something like this to make a really good operational system is find ways to accelerate the processing and the notification of the human cases. This is just a shot of some of the, the uh, forecasts we did for Ebola. I'm just going to skip through it and mention that we can take these same methods, which is a, a model inference system, a, couple of a coupling of a dynamic model with Bayesian inference methods, and we can use it to infer what's going on with the system. Right? It's like a souped-up Bayesian nonlinear regression, if you want. And we've done that to infer the spatial spread of Ebola in Sierra Leone. This is, again, work that Juan Yang uh, led. And we've actually used it recently to infer the colonization, asymptomatic colonization, of MRSA in hospitals, uh, 66 hospitals in Sweden over a six-year period. And this is a, a very complex model with very high number of degrees of freedom. It's an individual-based model in a net, an evolving network structure that we're able to match by where people are in hospitals and wards, because we have the patient records. And it allows us actually to infer the progression, the epidemiological properties, who's most likely colonized. And we were able then to actually test what would an optimal intervention strategy be. Would you use contact tracing? Would you use just a, doing it to everybody who's in the ward with somebody who's infected? Or would you use a model like this? And what would more likely better contain an outbreak of, of uh, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. We've also looked at the scales at which we do flu forecasts. We can do them at municipal, national, regional, state levels. What's the optimal scale? This is an outstanding problem that we haven't solved yet. We've done it in New York City at what's neighborhood scale. There are 42 neighborhoods in New York City. And we find real differences 
in the timing of the outbreak of flu in those neighborhoods. It's interesting because when you do it at the borough scale, five boroughs in New York City, you don't see that much difference. But when you get down to the neighborhood scales, you start to see it. Now, whether this is due to observational issues and healthcare seeking behaviors and insurance practices in different communities, depending on socioeconomic status, or it's real is still an undetermined question, but it's an interesting phenomenologically to pursue. We've also done spatial temporal forecasting at large scales. We built a model uh, using Department of Defense data that provided us influenza A positivity rates, and they had enough data for 35 states in the continental US that we could link them up. We used commuting patterns from the Census Bureau, and we inferred random movement. So this is a much higher dimensional model than that simple SIRS model I talked about. Instead of about seven degrees of freedom, six actually, it now has about 3,500. And we put it together with an ensemble comet filter again. We use the data. And the interesting thing about it is that when we have this spatial connectivity between the locations of the states, it improves the forecast accuracy measurably, very nicely. And in particular, this lead thing right here, which you're looking at right here, this is predicted lead to the time of onset, where the onset is the first of three weeks that flu is above some prescribed level, okay? And you can change the level if you want. The CDC uses levels as well, uses this. And the idea was, could we predict when that onset was going to occur and how far in the future? And when we run a model in isolation, which is what that red line shows, when we run it for just a single location like Indianapolis, we don't have much ability to predict how far in advance when you're going to actually get this onset right here. It's showing you a week in advance, maybe 50% of the forecasts are accurate. Two weeks in advance of it, when you predict it's two weeks in advance, you're getting it accurate maybe 35% of the time, and then it's down to negligible amounts, right? You're not particularly accurate. However, when you run the blue line right here, which is the metapopulation model, where you've linked everything in space using commuting and random movement, you're getting much longer lead times of predicted accuracy. And this is just the bulk without using the expected accuracies, et cetera. It's also showing you that the improvements for the blue line, this spatially linked model, are manifest over other seasonal uh, metrics that you might want to predict. Things like peak intensity and the timing of an outbreak. This just shows also that some of the statistics are improved. I see I'm very low on time, so let me cut ahead further. So we do this operational forecasting now for all 50 states and about, I don't know, 80, 90 cities in the United States right now. Uh, there it is for Indianapolis, the most recent forecast that we generated right there. Truth, we didn't do that well. As you can see, there's a lot of bumps and, and bruises there going along for Indianapolis this year, at least. Uh, if I showed you historical forecasts, they weren't that great. And there was a lot of stuff earlier on that it thought it was going to decline. Now, this is showing it for type A flu, all right? We're doing it by type here. Uh, but it comes with expected accuracies and uh, et cetera. So it's got everything on there. We're doing this in an operational setting. We're archiving it and trying to understand what goes on. So what, what do you do with all this, right? How are you actually going to use this in some way? Well, I think there are a lot of uses, and I think there are a lot of other uses that you guys could probably suggest to me that I haven't thought of. Firstly, I don't see why we shouldn't have a nightly flu forecast, ultimately. They already do give you the weather report. The weather report, they often give you pollen levels. They'll give you pollution. They may even forecast it ahead a single day. So why not do that with the flu? It gives you the right to know. The lead times of this, they're beyond four weeks, which is enough time for you to go out and get vaccinated, have the adaptive immune response, and have antibody-conferred protection against flu. That's a good thing. And simply just that awareness of what's circulating in your community is a very valuable piece of information for understanding what's going on, if you've got kids, whether you're going to play dates, et cetera. I think for public health officials, there's a different suite of activities they can do with it. We have a very large country. We need to distribute the vaccines and the antivirals, and there are antiviral shortages that occur throughout the country. If we can identify the places that are going to need them next with some fidelity, and there's some serious differences in when flu peaks and the magnitude of influenza outbreaks, between the coasts and between the south and the north. It's manifest every year. If we can do that, we can manage it better. Similarly, we can inform school closure decisions and whether or not the peak has passed or you should anticipate even more cases in the community and is it a problem. A real biggie is hospital resource and staff planning. So hospitals have to deal with patient surges associated with influenza every year. 
and they can be very catastrophic for them. They get overwhelmed, they run out of ventilators, they run out of beds, they run out of doctors and nurses because they all go down sick with the flu at the same time. So if they can manage the staffing, if they can get the gloves and the supplies and the needles, if they can figure out how to put the rooms together so they don't have somebody who's coming in with double pneumonia following influenza in the same room as somebody who's post-operative from open heart surgery, which they wind up with. And if they don't have to have people on gurneys with little tents around them in the hallways. And if they can deal with the idea that last year New York had to activate its emergency medical corps because it was so severe and set up tents outside the public hospitals at Elmhurst and Bellevue to handle the overload of patients because they didn't have any indoor places to put them anymore. So those types of management decisions ostensibly could be helped by influenza forecasting. We've actually done a little work to try to see how they're being utilized. Small sample, we're still working on it. It's an open question we want to address. So I'm gonna conclude here because I know I've talked for a while. I'm just gonna leave you with this. Firstly, accurate infectious disease forecast, not just for influenza, can be generated. It is a very valuable confirmation of our understanding of the processes involved in generating outbreaks particularly if you're doing it with a dynamical model, it's out of sample prediction. It's the validation of your understanding of the system in one context. It's not the be all and end all, but it's something that's very important and it should be pursued. And I think investment is needed if we're really going to improve this seriously. We've got to invest in our understanding, the observations, forecast methods, et cetera. So nod to all the funders of this work, as well to a lot of the people who collaborated with me on this. So thank you, and I'll take your questions. Yes. So first of all, it's a question about the about the West Nile virus and so on. So what would be the maximum amount of tweaks that would allow for the model to be as open as Right. Uh, you know, we, we have a paper that's actually coming out that addresses that but doesn't ask that question that way, and that's a good way of asking it. It, it says, you know, what was the consequence of the delay as observed? So basically, we can take the observed delays that we saw when we did this real-time forecasting during the 2017 season, and we can impose them randomly on past seasons and regenerate the forecast there because we only had a very limited suite of places that were able to provide real time or near real time mosquito infection rates. And then because of that, we only did it with a very limited suite of them. So we wanted to go back and do it with more counties retrospectively. And we say, if we have these observed delays, how much does it degrade the forecast? And we compared that to having perfectly timed complete data. I think what you said actually is more informed than what we probably put in the paper, in the sense that we should see, you know, well, what about an intermediate value? What happens if it's on average a week delayed, or two weeks delayed, or three weeks delayed? Will that work for us? And that's a, that's a very good question. I can't answer it specifically, though. Yeah. Yes. So Jason. I was uh, imagining that when you showed that uh, NSF forecast four years in the making, that you would forecasting would look like in 40 years. Uh, and uh, clearly, as you, as you pointed out, you know, sort of, we can take a page from the American weather forecasting. Um, but it's a really different process, right? The, um, you know, the, it's a chaotic system, as you pointed out. It's the physics are well understood. The biology of, mm -hmm. of epidemiological modeling is, you know, complex and, and they're both complex but different. So I'm I, I, was, I, was, I was sort of imagining, like, so for instance, one of the big improvements in weather forecasting is, you know, extensive real-time observation because it's a chaotic system. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're not going to be able to forecast so much in the future. And I was wondering if you had a set. I was trying. I was wondering if you had a sense of what, you know, what ways is this system different from mm -hmm. from that that you think might be sort of productive ways that we might be able to do even better than those guys or, or, or collect data in a different way or, or focus? You know. Well, you know, the, the way I think about it is I, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of, there's a lot more data out there than we typically have access to due to privacy, okay? Medical billing records has an enormous amount of data. 
Uh, there are a lot of streams of data that we could better constrain about vaccination rates, susceptibilities, uh, resolution in space and time. But I think there may be some real technological things that are more akin to like satellites coming online. I can seriously see a point in time where you get up and cough into your phone and it tells you what you got. Or you just breathe into your phone, it tells you what you got. And if that wires up to, uh, you know, hopefully they don't lock you up and put you in isolation at that point. But, you know, if that information is then available, that's going to allow for appropriate simulations at the right scales and whatnot. I also imagine, you know, far enough in the future, you cough into your phone, it tells you what you got, and then it generates a monoclonal antibody, sprays you in your face, and you're done with it. So we don't have to do the forecasting. Um, I, think, I think there are a lot of ways that it could happen. And there are a lot of different data forms. But I agree with your central point. There are differences about a biological versus a physical system in way, the ways you need to think about observing it and what you can do with that information, right? Uh, you know, we're never going to be in a situation where we're going to be actually tracking individuals in models that are agent-based models where you're simulating individuals and you know where they're going. You're going to have to either make it up or there's going to be some serious changes in people's privacy that, you know, that this country is not too keen on for rightly or wrongly, so I'd say probably rightly at that level, uh, that, uh, you know, that are problematic. So how, where do you get to that? I mean, there's a limit to what you probably can do sensibly with a compartmental model, but maybe not. Maybe if we find the optimal spatial scale for forecasting and observing uh, things, and that's a problem that we're actually working on now. We're actually taking these methods and flipping them even further and saying, what's the optimal scale for observing flu based on what we understand about error growth and making forecasts, et cetera? What's the optimal spatial scale for doing all this stuff? We haven't figured that out. And it probably differs for different pathogens also, I would certainly imagine. But if, once we do that, that might inform how we go about models and what are the new types of model constructs you would need to use to both simulate and understand what's going on there, but also make forecasts. Yeah. Awesome question. Go for it. Um, I was interested in one of the methods you mentioned for um, sort of making updates over time and acknowledging that the biology changes over the course of the forecast. Mm -hmm. um, it could be due to behavior, or evolution of the pathogen, all sorts of things. Um, does accounting for that sort of dynamic change and what's going on um, require a model that sort of has that type of change built in, or are there ways that you can just <coughs> adjust your uh, sort of estimates with a more imperfect, simpler model to get that right? Uh, you, you got them both right. Those are both. Those are the two options. So the yeah. one option is to try to explicitly model that change as a process hope that you've represented it appropriately and then that you can estimate that process. So you're adding complexity to the model and <coughs> you may need additional observations in order to make a well-constrained uh, forecast, given that. There's always a trade-off between adding complexity and unless you're adding information that you can bring to bear. The alternative is what's happening now, particularly with those single-pass filters that allows the parameter estimates to evolve over time that you're essentially relying on the data simulation algorithm to do it for you. You're just saying, you figure it out. You adjust it so that if something really changes enough within season, you're going to change it. So one of the things that we, we noticed in an inference paper, again, that Juan led at one point, uh, was that we didn't put it in the paper. I think we ultimately pulled this out. Was that within season, there's a discrepancy between how many uh, people had transitioned from susceptible to infected and how many final people you had susceptible. In other words, the filter was pulling people out of the susceptible pool also every time you went from prior to posterior. So if it's not happening by the process itself, is that discrepancy between what happens by the model and what happens by the filter due to vaccination? Is that a vac within season vaccine effect that you know, you're having that adjustment of susceptibility in the general population? Or is it that the filter just wasn't well resolved and it's moving around and something. It always tended down and it always went in the right direction. And the estimates were like nine, eleven percent. Areas where you'd say, oh, maybe, but you know, it's really hard. It's a guess at that point. Yeah. Yes. 